Hi everyone and welcome to Up and Ever Podcast. For this episode, I received Nadina Gale. Uh, she's an ecological, ecological engineer, a technologist, a TED Talk and keynote speaker. And she's also an interesting person to discuss about the use of AI and technology uh, for the nature. And more precisely, she's the person behind Internet of Nature, uh, which is a really interesting concept that we discussed during the podcast. And I will let her describe exactly what, what does that mean. But um, it was really insightful discussing with her about how we can use um, AI technology to improve the way we uh, we con- conceptualize, not conceptualize, the way we, we build the nature around us and the way we can help nature to maybe retake what we took from her and just try to improve the nature on us. It was really, really insightful. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast, listening to it, and feel free to share, like, uh, follow the podcast, and I would like to thank our presence for uh, the podcast and good listening. Um, I, I think worry, I think I'm just gonna I'm gonna be frank with people because they're gonna listen and then maybe gonna lose a bit of the spontaneity. <laughs> about I forgot to uh, record the first 15 minutes part that we were speaking about her background of uh, Nadina, and now we're gonna start a bit over with the question that I already asked. Um, can you explain uh, my first question? What can you explain just again? <laughs> What is urbanist and how ecologic system and urbanists can can work together? Uh, and I know, as, as you said before, there's different point of view about that. And if you can just explain a bit more uh, your point of view of what you do and how you do define what you do. And sorry again about the uh, the first mistake. Don't worry, don't worry. Um, so the urban ecosystem and I think how we define that is a hotly debated topic in my field. Um, So you consider it, you know, either the dense urban core and any form of nature that you find within that, or you might even broaden that definition to include, you know, the peri-urban and the suburban area as well. But I think in my definition, you know, an urban ecosystem is anywhere, you know, that, um, that, that, that humans um, and urban development and nature, you know, have to coexist with one another. Um, But even in saying that, you know, there's a certain, uh, I think, philosophical argument to be made that, you know, humans cannot really be separate from nature. And this idea that, you know, humans need to reconnect back to nature also can be problematic in certain degrees because of course, humans were never not part of nature. You know, we are nature. Every breath that we take, every step that we take, you know, we we are a part of nature. And to ever consider ourselves as um, apart from that um, is maybe problematic. I do think, however, that we have come much more removed from the natural world. And of course we evolved in a natural world. Um, and I think we see evidence of this in uh, the patterns of how we move, the patterns of our diets, uh, the illnesses and diseases that we struggle with today. Um, You know, we have evolutionary evidence for a whole lot of things about how we came to be. And I think a large part of that, if we look at the research that, you know, spending time in the natural world does to just to us, um, I think it's, I think it's pretty fair to say that that's an important thing to have in our living environments. And the fact of the matter is, is that those living environments, you know, over 60% of them, and that's only going to going to grow our our cities um so we need to we need to look at the the, the very nature that's at our doorstep mm-hmm. that got me thinking of a question uh, that i got the first time we discussed about that uh i think it's a two-part so i personally i agree with you if it's your position but i think it is about that we need to have a little or not a little a kind of connection with nature even if we live in big cities um Is this the purest position also? Yeah, and I, and I, I hope in the future it's a lot more. And I, I think mm-hmm. there's no other time like, um, you know, like the era, era of COVID-19 that we've been living in for the past year that's, that's really shown people just how important that is. That's what exactly the point I was trying to go. Uh, do you think COVID is going to be a nice opportunity to people? Like you said, we kind of uh, be confronted with the 
with the the necessity to be in nature or maybe that we are confined in a small space in big cities do you think covid going to change like the way we live with nature the way we evolve with cities with nature do you think it's going to be more of a, a different kind of city where maybe people don't specifically live in big city or live more in remote cities and can can use uh, work uh, from distance what do you think going to evolve kind of urbanization after COVID? I know it's a bit hypothetical, but what do you came yeah. to resolve about that? I, I mean, I think there's, I think there's two main trends that we're seeing, you know, on the one hand, the people that have had the opportunity to move away from cities perhaps have, I know that's a trend that, you know, we've seen across North America, you know, there's, and, and, and even so, if you look at um, not necessarily the housing prices but the rental prices have definitely mm -hmm. gone down at least in my home city of Amsterdam I know that's a fact and that's purely because people are you know if, if the entire city is locked down all that they have left is their apartment and perhaps their significant other or their family and that's all they have so why not you know in in you know enjoy that with more space around you I think a lot of people are starting to make those um those um transitions for themselves. And I think uh, COVID was definitely an accelerator of that, you know, maybe people that thought, you know, we'd want to move away from the city in a number of years have now done that much quicker, because all of a sudden, the the opportunity of remote work made that a possibility for them. Um, so that that is, on the one hand, I think, quite interesting. The other trend, of course, is is the people that maybe don't necessarily have the choice or the financial means or the employment means to be able mm -hmm. to move away from the city. And I think for For, um, for that segment of people um, who maybe, you know, would live in a city, you know, and, and work there, uh, you know, work very hard, you know, for 50 weeks of the year, and then for two weeks of the year, would go to, you know, beautiful national park or go camping or whatever it was for two weeks and recharge for the whole year, and then they'd be good to go again. Obviously, the opportunities with travel and restrictions in place, and even in some cities, you know, having five kilometer restrictions in place in terms of how far you can leave your house, that, of course, has abolished any idea of going camping anytime soon. So I think that has further exacerbated just how critical urban green infrastructure is. I mean, if you think at the, you know, the vast majority, I don't have any stats on this, but just, you know, anecdotally looking at myself and my neighbors, I mean, most of the apartments perhaps don't even have a balcony, let alone a garden or a backyard, you know? Mm -hmm. So these, these parks are people's shared backyards um, and we must, um, we must treat them as such and accessible and keep them safe and keep them a beautiful and, and safe places for people to be able to uh, congregate. And I think that especially again in this era of COVID-19, if you are stuck in a city, parks were the only place where you could, you know, see your friends at a safe distance, where you could uh, catch your vitamin D, um, where you would be able to, you know, have your exercise and walk your dog and all these important things. That was where it had to happen. So I think we've we've never looked at these spaces under under more of a under more of a close microscope than we have now. Do you think uh, those kind of ecosystems gonna develop in the future? Do, do you think COVID gonna have an effect on those kind of ecosystem? Because, um, like you said, uh, for a, a good part of the last year we couldn't use them, and now we are trying to use them the more and more and more and more. Uh, maybe too much because every people I, I know for myself that people. Uh, just go outside and go outside and place that they never maybe think of use in the last year. So do you think they're going to evolve positively, negatively, or what can be the effect on them? Um, especially maybe there was part before, but uh, trees can connect. So how oh, that's going to affect maybe those kind of ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, the, the you know, if you're, if you're stuck at home and the, and the only thing you can do for fun is to go explore, you know, uh, some new streets or some new parks. I mean, uh, I think it's, you know, kind of been a year of, of home exploration in that regard, whether mm -hmm. inside the home, I mean, I know home renovations have been at an all time high, <laughs> um, but at the same time that goes for outside the home as well, right? This idea of, oh, well, I've actually never been down that street. I've lived here five years. I've never been there. Oh, I always go to this park because it's the closest one, but I've never bothered to, you know, walk the extra 10 minutes and check out the other park over there. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's something, 
there's, there's something that can be quite powerful about boredom as well, you know, being forced to kind of pick up these, these, these new hobbies and new exploration. So I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. And hopefully what that does is it, you know, further emphasizes how important these spaces are for, for everybody in the city. And, um, and hopefully means we'll have a lot more of them in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just because I have other questions, but uh, they were part of another part that we discussed before. Uh, can you just go go back a little bit and explain again uh, your background and how how do you come to uh, in that field specific field and what was your journey up to that? Yeah, so I I did not grow up in a city. I grew up in a really typical North American suburb. And um, suburbia, of course, is you know the quintessential icon of urban sprawl uh, in North America, and you know has a lot of advantages. You know you have uh, backyards, and you have safety, and you have you know um, uh, other children to play with on the streets, and um, you know it was a beautiful childhood. But I think at the same time, you I, I at least started kind of you know questioning how is it that you know these um, you know, these natural forest systems or these fields that, you know, my friends and I would play in slowly kind of become enveloped by all these other subdivision developments. And the one thing that always stuck out that I thought was so weird is, you know, they would clear cut an area, put in these subdivision, you know, new developments, cookie cutter houses, you know, the typical iconic urban sprawl and, you know, not put in any sidewalks. It would just be for mm -hmm. cars. Each, each house would have their own separate driveway. And then what they would do after the fact, everything, after everything had been built, then they would come and put in a couple trees, a couple young trees. And I just thought that was so bizarre. And it, it, it led me to think even then, like when it comes to urban development, it's almost like the urban developers think that they are, you know, they are drawing, they're painting on this blank canvas. But in fact, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're adding, they're refining uh, on an already finished landscape painting. And they need to be able to consider that, you know, there is a natural ecosystem here and that actually the best way for them not only to build in a sustainable way, but also to ensure that the people who are going to live there have really long lasting and meaningful and healthy lives is to actually take that natural ecosystem into consideration. So obviously I did not put it into these terms as, a, as an 11 year old, but that, that's kind of, I think, where it started. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> that will be really, really a nice reflection for, but may, maybe it's possible to have a reflection, especially if you have maybe a, a parent to discuss that kind of question and they can feed you with uh, more information. But uh, yeah, that's a nice, nice thought. Oh, for uh, sure. But I, I, I assure you, I was not speaking in these terms as a child, but <laughs> it at least I think helped. <laughs> it helped. <laughs> It helped to um, it helped to kind of, I think, formulate some of the big ideas that I think mm -hmm. I didn't quite see myself come back full circle on after I did um, bachelor's and master's degrees in ecology and, and earth science and evolutionary biology, you know, just to purely explore all of these questions I had and to try and get some answers. And of course, when you do that, you know, you might get one answer and 10 more questions, but that's the beauty of what science is. Um, and I think it's eventually what led me to do my PhD in ecological engineering. When I, when I discovered the field of ecological engineering, I really felt like finally, you know, the, 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 the circle has come around again. Like uh, this field explores exactly those questions that I had. And, and those are namely, you know, how can we build sustainable ecosystems that benefit both humans and all other species that we, we share this planet with? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really can visualize what you said about, you, you know, urbanists and people just, we cut trees and we put house and we rip it, uh, we just add new trees and small, so small yeah. trees that they're going to break maybe in a year or two. And just the cities pay money to just put new trees because they said, oh, we need to have more trees in the city, but that's so nothing. Uh, yeah, I really see, maybe it's more North American, like you say. We really have well, like a big urban sprout for that, no? a big problem. Yeah, yeah, and it, I think I think the frustrating thing I think now is like because I mean this was not a the, you know this is not something that only happened you know uh, 20, 30 years ago. I mean it's something mm -hmm. that's still happening today. Um, I think the frustrating thing is I think now we're at a point um, where politically there's a lot of attention on tree planting campaigns and to get trees planted. 
But the, the frustrating thing about that is it shouldn't be about planting trees. It should be about establishing trees. You know, planting mm -hmm. the tree is only step one. There's so there's there's if you if you choose to plant a tree in a city, you have to realize that you are signing up for, you know, at least five years of good aftercare to make sure that tree can survive on its own. And especially when it comes to cities that, you know, have big lofty urban forestry targets and goals they, they want to hit. Um, typically, they call that urban forest canopy cover. So, you know, the amount of canopy of the tree that we have covering the city, typically those goals are around, you know, 30 to sometimes even 50% of the city they want to have canopy cover. And then, that might be the goal, but then when it comes and there might be, you know, very, you know, active organizations and parts of the municipality that are then planting trees to hopefully get there one day. But at the same time, urban development is happening in the way that it always did. You're going to cut down existing tree canopy cover, and then you're going to replace it by putting in new seedlings. I mean, that, that, that's gotta be a joke, right? I mean, that, that seedling, that, that seedling will take 30, 40, 50 years before it reaches the size that those mature trees had previously, if not longer. I mean, trees grow very slowly. So to cut them down is is not, especially in an urban environment where we, where we need them so heavily is not something to be taken lightly. Yeah, yeah. And it's that's really like a nonsense because like you said, we cut trees, but we put more on the uh, after. And uh, I, that got me thinking about a question. Maybe I don't know if you're an expert in that before going to technology after. Um, what do you think about all those? That's more a personal question. What do you think about all the, the program that say we're going to plant trees if you buy a shirt, a shirt you're gonna, we're going to plant trees in the north, north of the Canada and we just plant mm -hmm. a million trees, two million trees. Is this really impactful or is only like just putting seed on the ground and nothing happens after? Because like you said, you need five to six years yeah. to, 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 to make sure the, the, the tree has grown. So uh, is this really something that's going to make a change for the ecosystem or is just just some marketing and stuff like that? Yeah, there's, there's three main issues with campaigns like that. One, indeed, like we were saying before, it's about planting trees and not establishing them. You know, if you tell me you planted a tree that tells me nothing you know tell me how that tree is in five ten fifty years time you know then we can talk uh number number two problem is that uh typic typically eh, this is in general terms there's plenty of reforestation companies now that are doing things differently but generally traditionally speaking um tree planting campaigns in that way would focus on you know single species being planted in almost a plantation mm -hmm. type setting which is, you know, not at all, um, which is not, not at all the same as what, you know, what a natural ecosystem would look like. In fact, a lot of them, a lot of these tree planting campaigns, they say, well, we're going to do this because it's going to sequester this much carbon. But in fact, the, the, the tree actually newly planted trees, if you have to provide a lot of aftercare, are actually net carbon emitters in the, in the first several years of their lives before they ever start sequestering carbon. The real carbon sequestering heroes in this in the story is the soil. But you know, if you're going to plant the same kind of kind of trees on you know perhaps former degraded agricultural land, that's where you really need to focus your attention. You're much better off, you know, staying away from planting trees and perhaps moving towards the restoration of soil because that's that's a huge problem. That's a lot less sexy than planting trees, but not enough people are talking about it. That's where we're gonna have real wins in, term, in terms of carbon sequestration, and also in terms of providing the foundation for, for future life to grow on. And, and the third thing, of course, that is, can be problematic with large scale tree, tree planting campaigns is where are you doing it? And, and, and is, you know, whether you're, I always kind of have a problem of, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to emit carbon in North America or in Europe, but don't worry, I'm planting trees in Africa. That I think that's incredibly patronizing and condescending to the people there, to the local ecosystem there, and to how they, you know, what what you can, you know, you can you can trash it here, but make it better there. You know, it doesn't work uh -huh. like that. You know, you know, and that and that's why I I love the field of urban ecology because it forces people, or forces people, encourages people to become better stewards of the own nature right outside of their doorstep. And I think that's an incredibly powerful thing, not only for climate impact, but also just, you know, what it does to people as, as being more aware of their connection with the natural world. Yeah, it's more like an empower and maybe responsibilize the individual instead of all the society. Ah, that's interesting. 
Um, okay, uh, that's that was uh, that's what I thought about that because, like you say, but some of the point you made that I was not aware of, but that's really interesting because th those kind of of, of campaigns seems like just marketing campaigns, but you know sometimes stuff like that happens. Uh, and now going back to not going back, but just explaining how can technology really can improve those kind of systems <clears throat> and maybe improve the future of those systems and maybe a future of our system also, and maybe have a better ecosystem. How can technology be useful to that? <laughs> Sorry, I had to cough. I thought I'd mute myself and <laughs> yes, you did. You did. It, well don't don't subject your listeners to that. Um, <laughs> how can technology? So I think you know technology is kind of. Um, I mean, it's exciting in its own right, but I think one of the most important things when it comes to talking about technology is to see it, you know, purely as a, as a tool. Uh, you know, something that you know perhaps can help us do an existing process in a perhaps more efficient or optimizable way. So I just want to have that as a slight disclaimer to what I'm about to say. So I think the inspiration for me in terms of um, looking at technology as a possible solution is by the work of Dr. Suzanne Simard, a, a forester and professor at University of British Columbia. When I was first introduced to her work, um, you know, I was blown away as so many people are about, you know, the research she's been working on for the past um, 30 odd years about, you know, she really pioneered this idea of forest intelligence and tree communication. You know, scientists had known for, you know, a hundred years or more that tree roots and and fungi, a specific kind of fungi called mycorrhizae, um, had a you know a symbiotic relationship with one another, where you know the in, in exchange basically for the tree's root system, the fungal fibers would attach to the root tips and basically act as an extension cord, so that that tree would be able to access more nutrients and more water. And in exchange for that you know relationship that they had together, uh, you know the fungi would receive carbon from um, from the tree, uh, like a in, term, in, in a form of sugar so that, you know, the fungi can't feed themselves. They need to be able to have that from another source. Um, and of course, the tree is able to, you know, as long as it has exposure to light, is able to produce as much food as it wants. So, um, so within that, you know, the hundreds of years, scientists had known about that. And Dr. Suzanne Samard really um, pioneered this idea that, you know, not only was this happening, but these fungal fibers were actually connecting with other tree roots fungal fibers, meaning there was kind of this biological communication network. And this was really useful because what she showed is that they were actually able to share the same carbon solution, not only with the fungi, but actually with their offspring, with their kin. Um, sometimes they would even send it to trees that might look dead to us above ground. They're actually being kept alive because they're being pumped this sugary solution. Um, and it showed all these other amazing, uh, I mean, amazing research has come out of that since, you know, um, that uh, trees are able to send uh, warning signals to each other about about pests and about uh, disease uh, onslaught. So it's 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 really an, an incredible communication network. And um, one of the questions that I always had with you know, well, if that's the case that trees communicate with each other in these natural settings, what happens when you plant trees in cities? Are they still able to communicate with each other? And I always hypothesize that you know. If trees are in these really isolated tree pits, they're not able to communicate with each other. And um, you know, you might almost look at these um, these trees as as Peter Wallabine, the author of uh, the Hidden Life of Trees, puts it as street kids. You know, this idea that you know, yes, they can uh, they can they can grow and they can be by themselves, but they don't you know uh, enjoy that same kind of family guidance, community guidance that trees in a forest would. So if that you know, if we take that to be true then um, I always felt that, you know, if we want trees to be planted in cities, we as humans need to step in and, and be better tree stewards to them so we can actually ensure the best growing conditions so that they can, they can not only live their best lives, but that, you know, humans being the selfish and patient people that we are can, you know, exploit the benefits that, you know, we've come to rely on from that tree. You know, the oxygen it provides, the filtering of pollutants, the, the intercepting of stormwater, all of these things known broadly as ecosystem services. 
practices. And, um, you know, if we're going to do that, then perhaps technology can be a really, um, you know, important tool. And I think that's kind of where the, the, well, that's where the name, the Internet of Nature comes from. Because, you know, if we take this fungal uh, network to be, you know, Earth's biological communication network, well, then this is maybe Earth's biological techno communication network. And on top of that, more on a less philosophical, more practical side, there was, um, as I was working as an industrial and urban ecologist, having to you know, read multiple municipal agendas and visions, there was always the smart city agenda and then the green or the sustainable city agenda talking about its urban forestry targets. And these two agendas wanted the same things, yet they could not be more different in terms of how they got there. And I always felt like if only these could overlap slightly, you know, if only we could actually use smart city technologies to actually better monitor and reconnect people to urban nature, that could be a really powerful thing. So when those two things came together, that, that led to the conceptualization of the internet of nature. Can you explain, explain it a bit more what is internet of nature? So the Internet of Nature is uh, a concept um, coined in 2019 um, that I first talked about in my, my TED, TEDx talk and later um, we published together with um, my PhD supervisor at the time, Dr. Francesco Pila, and a fellow PhD researcher from UBC, uh, Sophie Nidislawski. Uh, we published a paper introducing the Internet of Nature to the world. And the Internet of Nature is a concept that basically provides the framework to look at all of the, these different ways that we can use uh, emerging technologies. So things like Internet of Things sensors, high-res satellite imagery, drone imagery, um, uh, natural language uh, processing uh, on social media reviews, um, you know, a, a wearable uh, technologies, biosensors, virtual reality, all of these new emerging technologies, how we could use those for uh, not only better monitoring urban nature, but also reconnecting people to urban nature as well. And that's what I've been focused on, on, on bringing forward ever since. So that's really using technology to, um, you not use nature, but to, uh, no, I like reconnect. Okay, I, I think I can see. Uh, I just trying to to imagine what kind of application. So maybe so let's say a sensor that can know if a tree is it's sick or it's growing faster or, or not not enough light. Okay, and uh, yeah. even Let for me... people. Yes, go go ahead. No, I was just gonna say because I um because it can sound abstract. So and let me give you mm -hmm. a let me give you a like a really concrete example. So um you know one of the main issues that and and again coming back to what I said about before, technology you know is not the be all and end all here. Use technology to better understand the problem. If we better understand the problem, we're you know we're much better suited to come to solutions. I think that's a that's a quote from the startup world. You know, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. And mm -hmm. that's something that is is really important to me. To throughout this, not to have it be framed as, you know, techno optimism and technology is going to save the world. But I do think there's a lot of really smart ways that we're able to use this. So um, speaking of problems, one of the most common problems that, that, that we face when it comes to planting new trees in urban areas is that new trees are typically planted um, when they come from the nursery, you know, they have their roots typically packed in these tight root balls, makes them easier for transportation. And when you plant that tree, it takes two, three, sometimes five years for that root system architecture to grow deep enough um, and wide enough to actually be able to access the groundwater uh, itself. Meaning that before it does that, you know, we as humans, as tree stewards, are entirely responsible for watering that tree. Because that responsibility is so large, in the Netherlands, we face, um, you know, an annual um, die-out rate of newly planted trees at about 15 to 20 percent. So 15 to 20 percent of all newly planted trees typically don't make it on an annual basis. So, of course, that's a terrible statistic, because when we think about the amount of effort and resources and carbon emissions and money that goes into planting these new trees and only for them you know to die a year later is of course terrible so um one of the things that you know i've i've been working on is this uh bringing forward this idea of Internet of Things soil sensors. So soil sensors is, you know, not something new. It's something that's been used in agriculture, specifically precision agriculture, for the last 15 to, to 20, 10 years, very successfully. Um, but 
limited parties really brought forward the idea of how we could maybe use this in urban forestry. So specifically this, this one company in the Netherlands called Soil Mania, I've been working with them uh, and you know, we've developed these really um, both modular but really robust sensors that can you know, deal with the stresses of an urban environment um, to be able to measure a whole host of things, but specifically moisture for this story. So typically around you know, the planting of a tree, you might um, install a moisture sensor with it. And that moisture sensor is going to tell you when that soil needs water. So that's an exciting part. Okay, well now you have real time information of when that tree needs water. So the watering crew is able to plan their schedule optimally. But of course, you know, what happens when it's been a really dry area and you know, all of a sudden it says, you know, all these trees need water. How can you get to them all on the same day? So one of the things that we're working on now is after, you know, we've been working with these sensors for about four to five years. So now we're actually at the point where we can learn from that past data as well. So we combine all those previous, and I know you're gonna love this from an AI perspective, we can mm -hmm. combine all of that previous uh, soil moisture measurement data with online weather patterns, soil information, tree information, and put that into predictive model that basically can tell you with a great deal of accuracy now, this tree is going to need water in 48 hours and it's going to need 150 liters of water. And once we reach that point, then you're completely you know, revolutionizing the sector because you're turning it from a very reactive to a much more proactive one. And I think that that's, that's an incredibly exciting point where we're at now. And I should mention, because that's kind of one of the common misconceptions about sensors that you need one with every tree and how is that ever gonna be financially feasible? Um, for me, it's always about you know, nature first and it's definitely not the intention to put you know, a bunch of plastic and technology with every single tree that also kind of defeats the purpose. Um, so what, what we're working on now is basically coming up with the, the absolute minimum amount of sensors that you would need within a site uh, to basically optimize watering there. So for example, if you've got really similar site conditions, the tree species is all the same, the soil type is more or less the same, like we had for a project in the south of the Netherlands, a thousand trees were planted on top of a tunnel same you know drainage same soil type same species of tree you know we were able to get away with just three moisture sensors for a thousand trees and in the four years that it's been there only one tree has died so we're incredibly proud of that <laughs> that's so much a better rate okay yeah. that's really really interesting i i think that's that's really nice i i think it's really really smart because like you said it's more proactive instead of reactive and you really switch and i really see now how you use technology okay and uh, okay so now you are trying to minimize the number of apparel of of a sensor sorry and the and having just better accuracy to say let's say that tree or those three need water of uh, that amount of water what will be the next tap or next interesting thing to use technology in that context or maybe another context just to go a little bit further what's is is this reinforcement learning or something like that is there a new thing you like to use to go further and further and further for that kind of problems yeah there's there's two things i mean on the um on the sensor side of things um, you know, moisture is a critical part, you know, a tree needs, you know, space, moisture, light, you know, those are kind of some of the basic requirements. Um, but on top of that, it also just needs to have, you know, high quality, good soil conditions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's increasing a challenge is the amount of salt. I know, especially in Canada, this is a big problem, the amount of road salt that we use on our roads, you know, for the six to mm -hmm. sometimes nine months of winter. Um, it's <laughs> incredible. That's an exaggeration, but, um, it, it, you much. know, it's, it's not that much. Yeah, it's pretty, um, it's, it's pretty intense, especially up kind of where you are. Quebec is a real, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm Anyways. further in the of Quebec <laughs> also, so it's a little bit more. <laughs> no, exactly. It's not, it's not looking good for the use of road salt anyways. Um, yeah, yeah, no, more exactly. More. <laughs> exactly. That's, a big, that's a problem that, that's a part, that's not a question, but that's really a problem to use salt because even for bridge, yeah. for car, for everything, it's any, they go in water, yeah. they go in river, they go everywhere. That's really not a good solution. And no, I, no, I remember as a small side tangent, I remember growing up in Canada, that was, that was one of the best ways to see moose in the springtime 
because they would come to the side of the roads and they would lick the sides of the roads because yeah, it would, yeah, it would yeah. be really salty. Yeah, yeah no, so that, I mean, horse too. They, they, they really like to, yeah. they need to have salt, yes, a, a block of salt, that, that's something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah it's, it's true. Yeah. And, and, and the worst part about that, because they're going to road, they're going to make me have an accident with a car. Yeah, so, exactly. they, so it's really a big problem and we still don't have bridge over uh, highway for animals. I don't understand why in Canada we still don't have that when we, yeah. we see that out about around out, out around the, the the world and especially here animals come to a uh, road because they they need the salt and they're gonna just yeah. and and uh a moose it's so huge not a moose uh, a moose it's so huge yeah if, yeah. You, if you have an accident with that if you're probably gonna die no and no no the, the the moose is walking away from that but you're not yeah, yeah exactly so it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no it's really a real huge yeah yeah i mean and that's the thing right i mean it's from like we have arguments to make from an ecological standpoint but also mm -hmm. just from like a like a public safety you know standpoint there's enough arguments to be made there but anyways the point is um road salt not good for the moose also not good for the street trees um because basically what happens is all of that ends up washing off the street you know in the springtime the rain comes precipitation events it ends up running onto the into the tree pits And basically when it comes to the health of a tree, when you can see the effects of salt damage, of too much salt damage in a tree, you're already too late. That tree is mm -hmm. basically not savable anymore. So if we can use a sensor to measure um, what they call electrical conductivity, which basically is just the amount of salinity in the soil, um, you, can, uh, you can actually make an amendment to the soil. You can add something to it called, called humic acid, which basically binds to the, the, the sodium particles, making them unavailable to the tree. So you can actually save that tree's life um, by adding that to the soil, but we need to know it's there be before it's an issue, right? So um, that's kind of an exciting development in terms of um, sensors that I think specifically, you know, for the, the North American and the Northern Europe context, I think will be really important. Um, another kind of exciting, uh, well, I'll focus, there's so many different ones, but I'll try to focus them a little bit on ones that use AI specifically. Um, another really exciting one is a, is a company out of the Netherlands also called Tree Tracker. And basically what, what they've done is um, that, you know, they'll have these scanners on top of cars that are, are LIDAR scanners, meaning that they, you know, create these point clouds. They measure the distance from the scanner to basically the next possible thing they do. And, and when you do that at fine resolution, you get something called a, a 3D point cloud. And that point cloud, which is basically this 3D representation, almost like a almost like a digital twin in a way of um, what the what the street trees look like, can be super beneficial in helping a municipality come up with a street tree inventory. And a street tree mm -hmm. inventory is is notoriously, you know, the foundation of any good urban forestry management plan and, and urban ecology plan. Um, but they are notoriously difficult to do because you have to send an expert into the field to do them. You can also do this with citizen science volunteers, which, which works great to a certain degree, but sometimes you just need that expert to be able to do things, you know, more difficult things like measuring certain things, assessing the, the damage, if any, to a tree and determining the species of a tree. Um, So you essentially need to do that, you know, all by hand right now. So there's, I think, a huge interest in using this technology and then using, you know, a whole host of different, you know, AI powered algorithms to decide, okay, based on this data that we have, this is the condition of the tree. This is the height of the tree. This is the size of the tree. Maybe in the future, this is the species of the tree, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's not to say that that will completely replace the work of an on the ground forester or arborist, but it will dramatically optimize that work so that, you know, Know, the the arborist or the urban forester can spend a lot more time doing what they're best at managing the urban forest rather than just collecting data all the time yeah yeah and i think that's really an important part here because i think now the more and more the tool that are developed for ai especially ai tools i mean uh, are really more about giving tools to the professional not replacing mm -hmm. someone because in that case specific case especially here uh, it's really really a, a nice tool because like you said I don't think we're going to send a, a person with a bachelor degree or doctorate or anything like that just to take a tape, measure uh, the, 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 the tree or something like that. We can use technology for that. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, I can really yeah. see 
Yeah, and that's really nice because they do classification. They can do everything. I, I, I'm more a technical guy, so I can see the logic segregation here. Yeah. I can see everything. That's really, really, really interesting. And, and, and the fun thing, David, is that, you know, it's, you can not only do it so much more frequently and therefore, you know, have, have um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, high temporal, you know, specific data, but, but also just, you know, it's so much more accurate. You know, and I've yes. I've been I've been the person that's you know measuring you know the diameter at breast height of of trees that's trying to estimate the canopy by looking up and asking you know someone walking by to hold the other end of the measuring tape. You know, uh-huh. I've done that, and it's it's even when you're doing it, you know, um, as as best as you can, it still remains an estimate somewhat. So to be able to do these things that have that pinpoint act which make all of the difference, especially when it comes to, you know, um, doing analyses based on the intersection of urban forestry and public safety, which is, you know, a a huge topic. Um, You know, how can you make sure that the tree crown is is, is stable so that it looks, you know, um, you can make assessments, you know, how likely is this tree going to fall down? Should there be a windstorm? Um, You know, how how far is it from, you know, how far is the canopy from the street? There are certain rules and regulations in place from that. I mean, the the applications of this kind of data at at this kind of spatial and temporal resolution are are endless. Yeah. And uh, again, that's proactive action. So it's really, really more interesting because like you said, is this, uh, is this tree going to fall in the next year or two years? So now we can take action before it fall, maybe just to trim some, some part and maybe save yeah. a bigger part of the tree instead of just cutting it down right now That's yeah. or after, after the damage. Oh, that's really rich. And I really like because everything is about monitoring uh, and I can really see now I can, how can we use technology to uh, just maybe not have bigger tree or something like that, maybe just to help our tree just to be more secure and like you said having the life that they deserve because they are a kind of they are a living species uh maybe yeah. the, the way in a human we can define ourselves but that, that's really really interesting okay and um what are what are the is there any friction in canada or maybe in place where you work uh and resistant about that kind of technology or is more about a big early adoption or some people want that or they are more like oh i don't want to see that uh they're not viable or something like that maybe viable or something like that yeah i mean the the biggest thing that you're going to run into um in terms of using technology in the in the in the ecology space or in the forestry space is you know how how could a technology possibly tell me what you know I I can see with my own two eyes in the field? You know mm. how how can they possibly give me better data than what I can see? And for that, there's there's two things. Um, for one, there are certain things that technology can do better than the human eye. For example, you know measure the 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 width um, uh, or the hi- the width of the canopy or the height of the tree. For example, I mean these things that we're doing now in the field are based on estimations. So there, and those things are really important. They're not something to be taken lightly. I mean, they're, they're not just an issue of, you know, helping to monitor public uh, safety when it comes to trees, but also, you know, if we want to move forward and, um, and quantify all of these different ecosystem benefits, uh, that the ecosystem service benefits that trees offer us, we need to understand how tall and, and, and wide the size of trees is going to be critical to, I mean, as you know, your model is only as good as your input data, you know, and you're, if, you know, if, if, if the better the, we can get the input data, the better things we're going to get out of those models. And those, and the outcomes of those models right now are what drive a lot of urban forestry master plans and what drive a lot of investment as well. So the better that data is, the better we can do that. And um, so, and, and secondly, we, uh, that technology is, is, as we were saying earlier, is not meant to replace you. It's meant as a tool to optimize the work that you already are doing. So that, you know, instead of, for example, the watering, you know, the most uh, kind of critical lesson that we learned from our work with soil sensors was that every urban forester that we talked to always said, I thought I was watering too much. And it turns out I wasn't watering enough based on what the sensors told me. So what does that tell you? That means that there's decades of trees that have been structurally underwatered. And that's and that's of no that's of no fault to the urban forestry. I can tell you when you're standing there, it's a small tree, and you're standing there with a hose for minutes because that tree needs a hundred liters of water. You're like, this is way too much. How like how could the tree possibly need this much water? But it, but it's true. That's how much they need. And so to be able to have that kind of real time feedback information, I think, is critical to not only 
you know, enabling people to do their jobs more efficiently and, and with better results, um, but also just, just learn, you know, who knows if we didn't have the soil sensors, they probably would have continued watering as much as they were watering and, and never would have known any different until we had lost a bunch of trees. So I think there's a huge kind of, un, you know, we, we don't talk about this enough is how technology can actually help us better understand the problems that we're trying to solve. Yeah, and then that's going back to understand the problem that you are trying to solve. That's really, really a nice part. Uh, yeah, okay. And um, is there any uh, political move to use those kind of tools or you can only see it only private or more, a, a small scope of municipality that are trying to use that? Or we can st we start to see the er adoption more in a political level level about especially maybe in yeah. Canada or maybe worldwide if you know the situation maybe a little bit about Netherlands or something like that. But is there yeah. a move going forward to that more political 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 level? Um, I think so far it's been pretty disappointing on the political level because on the political level you see these these big ambitions to you know have increased urban forestry cover to plant more trees. So then, you know, I get super excited because I'm like, perfect. This is a testing bed for all these new technologies that can help these, you know, trees, you know, not only be planted, but make sure they're established and make sure they're established properly. So, you know, it's so that we're planting trees, not only for seasons, but for generations. So I think that's, I've been quite disappointed in the past because you see these big political aims and ambitions and goals and maybe even master plans but you know the follow through to actually get it there the execution isn't always there and what i've actually been been really impressed by is that it hasn't really been you know the new york's the paris's the london's that have been setting the way i think politically yes i mean new york has had you know the one million tree campaign which received a lot of attention um london has the london national park city campaign which you know ha helps basically view um you know, nature in cities as a national park. So kind of reframing. So I think, you know, mm. big cities have their role to play in terms of being the big ambitious, um, I guess, leaders in, in almost the philosophy of it. But in terms of real action, I've seen a ton of really cool stuff happening on, you know, the, the mid to small city level. You know, cities like um, Harlem, just outside of Amsterdam, was one of the first that, you know, did this tree tracker approach to putting in their street tree inventory. Um, and there's been many other like that, even with the soil sensors, for example, you know, th this, you know, this isn't in Amsterdam or Rotterdam or, or Utrecht or The Hague. This is in, you know, much smaller cities that on an international level playing field maybe aren't as recognizable, but this is where it's happening. And I, and I think that's probably an interesting lesson in civic tech in general. And this idea of using technology in cities is that, you know, um, when it comes to new technologies, when it comes to new financing mechanisms, it's often easier to get this done in smaller cities and faster to get this done in smaller cities, perhaps than the larger ones. But it's cool to kind of see them, um, yeah, come into their own like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's your, what are your goals for the next five years, 10 years? Do you expect for yourself to maybe be an adv advocate about that? What do you, that's a kind of interview question. What are you, how are you seeing yourself in five years? Right. But I'm just interesting because what you, what you explain here, that's really fascinating. And I'm really curious what's going to be the, the next thing that you do or you plan to do. Right. Well, I mean, one of the, besides, of course, keeping up with the academic, so I, I, I hopefully mm -hmm. always see myself having, having one foot in, in academia and, and okay. one foot in practice. So hopefully that's something, that's something I've been able to create now. And that's hopefully something that in five years time I've been able to maintain. So I, you know, I still love being able to work on the research and publish academically on, on, on new technologies and, and case studies and, and be really, um, I guess, uh, as unbiased in that way to really look at it from a scientific point of view. Um, and again, that's close to my heart because this philosophy is very much not about, you know, driving one technology necessarily forward. It's about seeing what could be the possible best fit. But on the other hand, I also believe that if we really want some of this stuff to take off, it's not about, you know, science saying that this is the best solution. It's about what the market wants. So I'm really interested in the commercial side of things as well. And that's why I've been able to get involved with organizations like Soil Mania to see if we can actually drive these innovations forward and get them picked up by the market. 
because you know we you know researchers and scientists can can shout from you know the treetops if you will this is great um <laughs> but you know if 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 you know urban foresters and arborists on the ground uh, the, you know the, the subcontractors by way of speaking that are that are driving their truck to go water these trees if they're not seeing the value in this technology then it, it's not going to happen so i i, I both um you know philosophically and from a practical standpoint, I believe holding that balance is important. And it's also um, as an ecological engineer where I see an important role in myself to, to be that translator, to be able to translate engineering concepts to ecologists and e ecological concepts to engineers and vice versa. And I think that that lens of technology helps. Um, and on another level, I hope to always be in the position where you know, I'm, I'm able to, to, to speak and, and, and do podcasts and interviews and, and speak on um, stages when that becomes a thing again, to, to be able to, 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 to share this as, as wide as possible and, and, and spread the message. I think science communication is something that's um, always been very dear to my heart. And I think that's one of the most, I think that's one of the biggest responsibilities we have as researchers as well as is, is sharing what we learn. So yeah, whether that's through um, uh, a podcast or videos or, or, or I'm writing a book as well. So we'll, we'll see oh. what, we'll see what happens. Uh, I agree with you that, uh, as a researcher, we, you we really need to, uh, facilitate the communication with the people, the public, because what we do, and I speak with my colleagues, it's so easy. I, we understand each other, but trying to explain that to my mother or my father, it's so challenging because, uh, I know lot of thing in my field but outside maybe people don't know about it so and what yeah. do you think is that uh, for more uh, philosophical uh, uh, point of view what is the uh, you think the best way to uh, achieve uh, that kind of communication with the public is it by podcasts or ted or ted talk or maybe course starting from a younger age what do you think right. is the best a way from a philosophical point of view? Yeah, um, well, I think, I think the, the TEDx talk that I had to do was, I think one of the most um, uh, difficult things that I've ever had to endeavor on my, on my career journey so far, you know, having to be able to sustain all, you know, or to condense all of your, your research and your ideas in a, you know, 15 minute talk that at the same time was really engaging and be able to be understood by, you know, your grandparents was, was a real challenge. So going through that process and, you know, having the privilege to work with like, a, you know, when you typically, when you do a TEDx talk, they give you a, like a speaker's coach to work with as well. Okay. So being able to do that was an incredible experience for me to, um, just just test the waters and see what worked and what didn't you know with this coach which I, which I'd never gotten the opportunity to do before so that was that was really cool um I think another thing that uh, I am attempting to do now is for every academic paper that comes out write a blog about it and write mm. the blog as if you're talking to you know your your little sister or your grandmother or anyone your neighbor <laughs> anyone who's not in your field uh and you know explaining to them what you did i think is 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 so powerful because there's there's so much to learn um that being said it's a uh continuous challenge especially with blog writing that i run into as well and my colleagues will tell you this too because i have been known to you know get carried away in a metaphor or, you know, try for the, for, you know, to, for the narrative and for the aim of science communication, perhaps oversimplify things too, too much um, and lose, of course, the important scientific nuance that there is in there as well. So I think that's, a, it's a difficult balancing act, you know, so there's, um, but again, typically universities also have great communication departments that are able to help you with this kind of stuff. Um, and I mean, the last thing is, I mean, I, podcasting is the future. I mean, there's there's so much uh, so much ground that you can cover, uh, more ground that you can cover via podcast than you are via um, you know a written interview or perhaps even a cut video. There's there's something very human about being able to listen to these long form conversations that I think really hit home to people, you know, and whether they're they're watching this or whether they've, you know, got it in their parts while they're doing the dishes, there's so many ways to be able to just soak up knowledge via podcasting in a way that's that's very human. So I I, I like that medium a lot too. 
I completely agree with you. I have so much podcasts that episode that just changed my point of view about something that I did not yeah. even know to think about. Just people just explaining stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's so true that sometimes I connect with people that way and sometimes that way. Maybe just the way we connect or the way we interact with people or just historical information and everything. I really found it. And even here as, as, a, as an interviewer, I found my practice that I sent so much because all the, the discussion I had with people to just, oh, I never thought about that or I never thought about that point of view. And specifically the example that you did uh, earlier, I was never aware that we can use technology that way, that now I can see more opportunity in the, in the field I used, I, I, I'm training now, such as the machine learning. So I think, yeah, podcasts, it's really interesting. More than interview, like you say, because sometimes an interview about 15 minutes or written interview, it's so short. They are trying just to get some some details and the question they have, and we, they don't try to bounce on the question or something like that. Uh, do you have a podcast that you really like that you would like to share to uh, to a listener? Oh, good question. There's so many. Maybe you can give um, more than one, maybe two, three, four. I'm going to try, I'm going to write it down. Well, I mean, of course, like, um, you know, one of the most popular podcasts that, you know, recently has made an even larger breakthrough is the Joe Rogan experience. Oh yeah, I mean, for I, sure, think yeah. That, I think he's, you know, I think he's kind of been one of the founders of this long forum content. I mean, when he started, I mean, at this point, what is it? 10 years ago, eight years ago, people would look at him and say a three and a half hour podcast. Are you kidding me? Who is <laughs> going to listen to that? You know, how and now you it's ever... more, give me more, give me give more than three hours, yeah. uh, give me four, five, six. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's true. And that's kind of, I mean, this, this idea of, of the live stream has come out of that mm -hmm. as well. So I think, I mean, that, I think that's a really interesting one. Um, oh God, there's so many, uh, there's, um, in terms of, uh, I, I think, uh, at the intersection of, of health, um, diet, wellness, and climate change. Um, the doctor's pharmacy, pharmacy with an F, I think is an incredibly um, um, uh, scientific, you know, medical, but in easy to understand terms. Um, same in that kind of similar field, but then a, a little bit more focused on the medical side of things is Peter Atia's The Drive, which I think is really good. Um, oh, and I, I love um, podcast by, um, uh it's called the dark horse podcast uh okay. by um heather and brett weinstein and um they're evolutionary biologists that just have an, a really fascinating take on a lot of kind of day-to-day -day issues um there's uh the jordan peterson podcast which is back since of recent he always has really interesting guests for extremely kind of long forum nuanced discussions about certain things um there's like other podcasts like uh like how it works and of course this american life another like podcast hero um god there, there's so many that what is that that's <laughs> that's seven that's, <laughs> that's good luck enough. just getting through. <laughs> if you've never listened to a joe rogan podcast before you've got your whole life cut out <laughs> you yeah, yeah, yeah. to cover <laughs> yeah i i listen more of the shortcut version sometimes just interesting part because I have too much podcast to, to listen. Um, I know, yeah. There's so much good stuff out here, depending on what you what you like or what you're interested in. And uh, a final question. Is there a book that you would like to recommend? It can be a normal book, a academic book, or just anything that you like to read, a blog maybe that you, you, you say that people need oh, to yeah. read about that or people need to, to read that? Um, there's a, there's a book actually that I'm almost finished, um, called, uh, Overstory and, um, the Overstory is, um, so it, it talks about, you know, some of the things we talked about today, this idea of forest intelligence and tree communication. Mm -hmm. Um, but it speaks specifically about, you know, the role that, that trees of any kind or of one specific tree have had throughout history to all these different people. And then eventually without spoiling it you know, these stories start to intertwine in a certain way. And it's just, it's beautifully written and it's, it's very thoughtful and um, very much on brand. So that would be, a, that would be a good one. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you for for all the explanation and everything. And uh, and uh, I will I will definitely uh, keep going to un to to read about what you do. I'm really interested in what you're doing. And thank you again for for the interview. Thank you for having me. You're a great interviewer. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.